Well, thank you for that, and I'm uh, pleased to be here. Um, and it'll come a little bit out of left field in the same way that you could think of the term can cancer cells in the lifetime of in an individual in an evolutionary sense. You can think of uh, behavior and symbolic events in that way. They're intertwined with their gen genetic and epigenetic inherent systems, but they're inherent systems in their own right. And they can be analyzed, I think, fairly directly in terms of variation and selective retention, both at the individual and at the cultural uh, level. Uh, physical health problems are fairly obviously be behavioral problems as well, both as effects and as causes. Uh, lifestyle is critical to many diseases, stress-related diseases and so forth, but also just being willing and able to use uh, the various things that we develop in terms of uh, the um, medical uh, science, including the use by practitioners and researchers, as was mentioned earlier. So the behavioral domain has come up in here, by my count, at least 20 times in the morning. Uh, and it, it sort of obviously requires an analysis and some thought. It can go wrong in many ways, considered just in its own terms. And some of those important ways, like multi-level selection and things of that kind, would, uh, I'm not going to talk about. I'm just going to talk about uh, insufficient variation and problems in selection as a way of organizing an example. And it's only one of many, so uh, uh, I'm just primarily talking about my... Uh, own work here, but uh, it's a larger set. And in principle, if, if evolution theory is correct, it applies to everything that works, and it's a matter of figuring out how, how that is, but this is an example of it. So are there major known processes that can restrict behavior variability? Uh, and if so, what are they? Well, there are many of them, but two big ones that we know about. One is avoidance. Uh, if I were to run down here and take you grab Randy's throat very tightly. Of all the many, 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 many things that he could be doing right now, suddenly only one thing would be important. Rep no, his rep his you know, repertoire would narrow down to one thing, and one thing only is important: of being able to breathe. Yeah, and uh, you know we are sort of evolutionary adapted to do that to focus our attention, you know, elicit our behavioral resources, mobilize our physical resources to stand to challenges that require escape or avoidance. But human symbolic behavior, and there is underneath this work a whole theory called relational frame theory, a very active area of research, which unfortunately I'd waste, not waste, but I'd use my 20 minutes very quickly if I tried to even talk about the basics of it. So I'll just talk about it in a more common sense way, that we are able, due to what happened somewhere around 100,000 years ago, maybe 200,000 years ago, and on steroids within the last few thousand years, and on ultra steroids within the last well, just within a couple, few lifetimes, really, uh, we are able, through the symbolic stream, to avoid not just direct threats, but also memories, reminders, emotional responses, thoughts, and so forth. We can turn uh, this escape and avoidance process towards the world within, conceptualized, recalled, thought about, feared, projected. Uh, the result is what we call experiential avoidance. Um, it's a kind of evolutionary mismatch between what happened more recently, within 100,000 years, but has, we've just been documenting recently, for example, how many words are your children exposed to now versus 50 years ago or 100 years ago, and it's orders of magnitude higher. And inside those words are horrific images, a huge flow of judgment. It's a real challenge to children to sit inside the world we've created through science and technology and communications. We did not evol evolve to avoid threats from within in the form of thoughts, feelings, memories, and bodily sensations, but nevertheless, that is what we do. Modern culture has exacerbated it by giving us incredible increase in exposure to pain. If anything horrible happens in China over the next 10 minutes, a mother throws her babies off a bridge or something, you'll see it on, well, since we've got permission to you know, use our iPhones, you can see it on your iPhone within minutes. If, it, you know, if, it was, if video was taken, you can watch the video. That's a different world. And in addition, we have, through science and technology, more and more ease, less and less exposure to small amounts of distress, which is easier. But it also means that we get less training in how to even deal with any kind of small amounts of distress. 
And we have a huge cultural encouragement towards experiential avoidance. Randy's point about, you know, would you not want to feel physical pain? Well, if you ask that to just normal people, would you not want to feel anxiety, depression, sadness, even just sadness? People say yes. If you say, when your mother dies, they'll pause. But if there was an anti-sad pill, I guarantee a lot of people would be taking it, even at the cost of not crying if mom dies. We have become a kind of a society that is seeking the vision of no pain. This process of trying to not feel, think, and remember what you feel, think, and remember as a way of regulating your behavior is arguably the most toxic psychological process we know. It accounts for 15 to 20% of the variance of anything you can name. You got a secretary, you can't learn a new software program, very likely this is why. It'll be said, oh, I just don't computers, or whatever. but really what it is is I don't like feeling uncomfortable. I don't like feeling stupid. I don't like not knowing. And uh, this is one of, and that applies not just to that, but to anxiety, depression, substance abuse. You go through it. Even the ability to create people who can't sit with discomfort turns out are less creative. So in almost any area you name, if you are at war with the world within, you are uh, to some degree disabled. And it becomes a selection criteria in its own right. You know, this uh, avoidance journey of the feel good, you know, off in the distance is something we might want, but it kind of feels better to, yes, I want intimacy, but I don't want to feel fear, and so I'm going to blow up this relationship because this person's too unsafe because, frankly, it might go somewhere, and that would make me feel vulnerable. You know, we can easily get in our way of just evolving towards what we say we really want if the alternative agenda is adopted of feel good, feel good, feel good at all costs. So that's one repertoire narrowing process. And the problem is, is that effective behavior often gives rise to unpleasant emotions, thoughts, memories, and bodily sensations. Healthy behavior, you exercise, you're not gonna initially feel good. If you're overweight, you're not gonna think very well about what other people are thinking about you. One of the single biggest barriers why people don't exercise is people look at them. And then they don't like thinking what they think when they see people look at them. Um, if you want to regulate your food intake, that's not initially going to feel great. If you're going to stop smoking, same thing. And you just go through it, these, this, this little behavioral fence that keeps us from evolving in a positive way. Plus, there's certain kinds of things like chronic pain. Most chronic pain patients, I don't care what kind of pumps, et cetera, you have, are going to be in pain the rest of their life. Can they have a life or not is the question. Not to, can they have pain or not. And if you're going to have the pain go away before you have a life, you're not going to have a life. You're much less likely to have a life. Tinnitus, 8% of the people in this room, I'm doing calculation by the average age, uh, have some degree of ringing in your ears right now. Uh, you know, it can blow up a human life waiting for the ringing to stop. There is no uh, medical intervention that's going to remove that, but there are psychological interventions. I'll even show you some data that can help. Fortunately, people can learn. You can learn to be more open and curious towards your own thoughts, feelings, memories, and bodily sensations to be more flexible with regard to them. The amplification of avoidance is not necessary. Another repertoire narrowing force is cognitive entanglement. Uh, verbal rules can promote new behavior, but they can also reduce variability. It's called a rule for a reason, the Latin word of a straight line. Uh, regula, and uh, you know, from which we get regular and rule. So when you're following rules, you're following a pattern that your mind is giving you. Well, that's by, some, by definition, in some sense, is less variable when it's outside the rule. And so learning uh, to uh, allow our uh, behavior to evolve based on direct experience is hard for us. We have to take like inner tes tennis lessons to hit a tennis ball or inner golf to do it, and not overthink the shot, etc. Um, it's hard for us, and we get less training in that over time, not more within our culture, I believe. The trick is to know when to follow rules and when not to, to be able to back out of that. Not everything in life is a, a literal, analytical, verbal problem so to be solved. Uh, rules tend to fail when they're untestable, inaccurate, or when actions aren't readily rule-governed, and a lot of our actions are not. This system that arrived only in the last 100,000 years or so you know, sitting on top of many, many, many functions which are just not well regulated uh, by that. And learning how to make that distinction is hard. It itself also becomes a selection criterion. And you're probably, a, if you're in a department, you may have seen some folks who like taking this detour, be right at all costs. You know, the entire group would do better if we just kind of learn to listen and hold multiple thoughts at once and find what would work best. But no, we're going to have the same argument again. And meanwhile, there are things off in the distance that might be helpful to us. Fortunately, people can learn to notice their own verbal rules and those of others from a bit of distance, not to uh, 
no longer be able to use rules, but to instead be able to pick and choose on the basis of their workability rather than just automatically, if I have it and it all fits in a big network, it's right, and I, might, and I like being right. Do you know the first graders fight on the schoolyard more about being right than any other single thing? This didn't, it's to have happened pretty early on, what goes on in your departments. Uh, <laughs> Now, there are ways to doing it. Mindfulness training has been around for thousands of years, learning to back up and just kind of watch the chatter. And we've evolved some methods through metaphors, exercises, and other things that very quickly can get a little bit of separation, and you can watch that cognitive stream go on without necessarily knee-jerk having to either do it or not do it based just on what your mind says. And then there's the issue of selection criteria. So we're looking at two sources of invariance. Selection criteria matter. But in fact, people haven't thought much very often about the qualities of action that they really want to manifest in their life. They're just not being asked those questions. There's a recent study I was mentioned to somebody in, in science, a guy in Cohen at UCLA, you know, showing that if you can get middle school kids to write this for 20 minutes, I think four or five times in a year, a third of the black-white gap disappears in high school. Which almost makes me want to cry. I mean, somebody, nobody asked some of these kids, what do you really care about? It was never asked. I never thought about it. Just 20 minutes, four times, and making a big difference going forward for a period of time, and especially uh, people who are uh, disadvantaged uh, uh, in various ways. Fortunately, we can do this. We can bring a values conversation into the world. It's not technically hard. And it's known to be a powerful method of motivating behavior change. And we have a lot of behavior change technology that's sitting there waiting to be used, but people aren't motivated to do it. If you put those two things together, that's a powerful uh, thing we can do. So greater psychological flexibility, which is all these things going together, more, more openness, more focus on what works and linking your behavior to it, can empower behavior change and make it a, a, a difference. Now, a number of the modern behavior change methods out there in the cognitive behavior therapies, behavior therapies, et cetera, such as the work on mindfulness and compassion-focused treatments are doing this, the acceptance and commitment therapy or ACT, we also call it acceptance and commitment training when we're using it outside of the clinical context. Same basic idea, same basic technology, but done in a way you can put into businesses, schools, and things like that when nobody's particularly looking for therapy uh, is just our particular way, and it is one of the better known, I suppose, of the several things that evolved over the last 15 years or so that are based on psychological flexibility as a target. Uh, ACT has about 60 randomized trials and if, probably two or three times as many if, if you look at psychological flexibility writ large, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, dialectical behavior therapy, a whole alphabet soup out there of these things. I'm gonna show you a few examples just from behavioral medicine, but actually the evidence is probably, if anything, more powerful in areas like anxiety, depression, substance abuse, that we can fairly quickly change human lives by focusing on uh, variabil increasing variabil healthy variability and looking at the, what the selection criteria are. I'm gonna show you outcome, and I'll mention as I go what the processes are. The processes in some way matter more than the outcome. You really want to know that the reason why those outcomes happened was because people got more flexible and variable in a healthy way and more connected with those values-based selection criteria. We do have that evidence, and I'll mention it as I go. But what I want you to notice is just that you can get a lot of change with a little uh, <clears throat> just by focusing in that way, and that it seems to work across multiple more uh, modali uh, modalities, uh, like through books, uh, uh, web programs in person, and has this unusual transdiagnostic impact. It doesn't seem to matter very much what the particular problem is. These same simple Evolution 101 ideas give you some leverage that is uh, helpful. So this is a study that was done in East Palo Alto, published in JCCP, probably the best clinical psychology journal there is. So just down a few miles from here, relatively poor, a fair number of uh, minorities with type 2 diabetes. And what we compared was six hours done in a workshop of American Diabetes Association approved education about how to handle diabetes. It's required, by the way. ADA approved educa patient education is required. It's almost an inert technology, unfortunately. It doesn't do very much good to people. And instead, we're gonna take out three hours of that, squeeze it down, and put in three hours of training, and you can open up to your feelings, you can back up from your thoughts, you can focus on your values, and you could do that with your diabetes. Um, here's what happened, uh, skipping the ones on, on the left for right now. In terms of self-management, the number, uh, this is, these are just change scores, so the percentage of those who 
uh, who are showing good self-management in terms of increases from baseline. If you go three months out, then this is right, uh, uh, this, this mediates this. Because of this, you get this, about a 50% increase in the percentage of those in diabetic control three months later. Uh, this increase in self-management comes because people are more flexible. So we know the mediational path. You get them more emotionally flexible, they do the behaviors, they do the behaviors, they get the disease under control. It would predict about an 80% reduction in loss of limb and blindness if it continues. But what's interesting is, uh, you know, and by the way, American Diabetes Associated Improved Education, it's nothing. Um, a rather large impact uh, for a very little amount of input. These are three studies with smoking comparing this approach to nicotine patch, propion CBT, and these are at one year follow-up objectively monitored smoking outcomes, percentage not smoking at the end of one year, significantly better outcomes across these three randomized trials. One of those is fairly big, a couple of them are moderate. This is a new one that Jonathan Bricker at the University of Washington at the, uh, at the cancer center up there did just quite recently, it's not out yet, but comparing it to smokefree.gov, all of the states have dial-up lines, you can get help and you have a website you can go to that's federally created to help you quit smoking. A randomized trial, reason, kind of moderately sized. This is at three months later, so the quit rates are a little higher here than they were at the one year. About 18%, 11% of those have been smoke-free for at least a month and act 44%, 23% of those have been smoke three at a month. If you just think of what you could do, it's a website, it doesn't cost you very much, just to send people there by double, more than doubling the quit rates just by using uh, science that's focused on these processes of flexibility creation and getting people linked to their values. It would be kind of an important thing to amplify that out. Uh, this is a little study, and it's embarrassingly small and short, but it's a part of a whole series of studies now that have been looking at, at exercise and obesity. Can we do better than best of breed that's out there in terms of the psychosocial methods for that? And the answer is yes. Um, this is the first study that we, that we did where we took people who are already involved in Jenny Craig or some other kind of program, and all we're going to do is simply add five hours of work with them on helping them to be more open to their emotions and more mindful of their thoughts, more focused on their values. Nothing about weight control whatsoever in there other than the content of the stigmatizing thoughts and difficult feelings. Um, and three months later, we're getting better rates in terms of these relatively small weight losses. So it's more of like a, a pilot study. But what's interesting about it, what mediated is things like this. Can you hold your breath and for how long? A 30-second increase in holding your breath from the morning to the afternoon that it was done in a single-day workshop predicted whether or not you're going to lose weight three months later. So some of what's going on here, people just don't have training in sitting with discomfort. They don't know how to do it in a healthy way. They try to suppress it, avoid it, look away. That blows up on you. And just that little bit seems to be helpful. Uh, this is a study done at the Karolinska. It was published in pain by a team there with multidisciplinary treatment for pediatric pain. ACT is on the list of most best approved uh, pain methods by the American Psychological Association due to studies like this. In this multidisciplinary approach, in the Karolinska, you know, it's quite a nice center if you've been there. You know, they actually keep these kids on treatment all the way out to six and a half months out. Here, we only treat them to there and then we stop. This is how much interference is going on in their life. Down is good, it means they're going to school, they're doing what kids should be doing. What are we teaching them to do? Back up, watch the pain monster, focus on what you want to do in your life. Things start evolving in a different direction. With kids, the pain actually goes down. With adults, not. But uh, meanwhile, life shows up in both of these populations. Uh, you don't have to be a chronic pain patient defined by having your life be about a pain. Um, this is a tinnitus. I've had tinnitus, and that's why I did this uh, study. And I had to get suicidal before it occurred to me to to apply my own life's work to it. This never occurred to me. It took three years. I'm thinking about shooting my head off because of the damn noise, and then it occurred to me, I'll just apply my method to it. It took one week, and it was gone. The noise isn't gone. The disruption's gone. But it turns out the noise is actually gone. If you don't attend to the noise at all, most of the time it's not there, except when it is there, like, for example, right now, because I'm talking about it. Uh, well, we did how man this is the largest psychosocial st study ever done on, uh, on tinnitus published in my, my, it's not my study, it's done out of a team at Uppsala, uh, Gerhard Anderson, 
published in Behavior Research and Therapy just a year ago. And this is tinnitus retraining therapy. If you go to audio, an audiologist, and as, you know, about 8 10% of you have this problem, you're going to get this recommendation. It's not very good technology. You can look at the pre-post, six-month, 18-month follow-up. We can significantly beat what's out there, not by noise machines and all the rest, but by potentially teaching the kind of attentional flexibility to not be linked, listening to your ears to, to stop ringing. They're not going to stop ringing. So you just, uh, it gets, you know, like the best coping strategy for tinnitus, none at all. People have a hard time doing that. We're very mindy people. We want to have a solution. Turns out a solution is toxic. The non-solution is a better solution. And this is my last study, and then I'm going to end. Uh, this, this I almost don't know if to, whether or not to believe. There's, it's been replicated, but not yet with continuous EEG monitoring. This was done in South Africa. These are folks who actually, part because of the stigma, if you have epilepsy, you get put actually on like a reserve there. And they're on the second, third, I mean, old drugs that make your teeth fall off. All kinds of bad things happen. The drugs that folks in the West wouldn't use anymore. Um, and we're going to go in and we're going to teach them to sort of walk into an aura without pulling the trigger of, oh my God, I'm going to have a seizure. You can actually do that. You can teach people to sort of sit inside that space and some things happen. These are rate of seizures from the nurse's records in terms of minutes or time per month. Watch what happens with about eight hours of ACT. It's about a 95% reduction in seizures. Quality of life comes up gradually over the next year. It's predicted by acceptance of the sensations that are involved uh, and some of the difficult thoughts that are involved. Is that real? I'll believe it when I have continuous EEG monitoring. So I present it with kind of like, I don't know, that's too dramatic. Did you just make that data up? It's not my study, but it's been replicated. But it's possible. It's possible. There's hardly any psychosocial studies because people don't believe. It looks more like a panic attack, frankly. It looks more like a panic attack. And that's physical, too. I, I had a history of panic disorder. Believe me, it's... Uh, all right. Acceptance, mindfulness, and values can make a profound difference. But getting it into the system is hard. Behavioral health specialists tend not to be in primary care, et cetera. Plus, they don't do evidence-based things very often, so it wouldn't be very good even if they did. But maybe we can get in there through cultural change. You can hardly walk 10 feet without running into somebody who's talking about mindfulness nowadays. Plus, web-based things might work. If I had the two minutes, I'd show you a little piece of some grant-based, web-based development we've done. I showed you some web data. We can actually do this on the web. And so my final thought is just that behavior change is critical and variation and selective retention can guide the, the, our work in developing more effective technologies as to how to uh, create positive health behaviors. Thank you.